and thank you very much to Bruno for your talk, and thank you to Eduardo and Deborah very much for the invitation to speak here. Uh, this talk began a year ago when Eduardo spoke to me about this idea for this workshop. And um, I met with him again in, in May in Paris, and we were discussing um, what paper I should give. And he mentioned that this week there would be the same conference in Rio as uh, at the, the, the conference of the petroleum organizations this week. And um, I thought that would be a very opportune moment for me to try to, to speak in that context here in Rio about the petroleum industry in South Africa. And to try and think about what it would mean to think of our planet as Gaia uh, in the Anthropocene in a very particular part of the Earth, which is South Africa. And to try to think through one particular case study that is a tremendous debate in South Africa and elsewhere in the world in the USA, Brazil, China, Poland, Australia, and that is fracking. And so um, what I want to try to tease out is, 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 is what does it mean to do an environmental humanities, an ecological humanities in, 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 in this kind of a context. But perhaps let me begin by saying that as a South African, I speak from a heartland of struggles over land and soil and ocean, of contests over economy, of food production, and mineral rights. I speak from a landscape in which my great-great-grandfather in the 1820s left the coattails of English society to take ownership of land that became a farm that had the name of a military post of the British Empire in their frontier war against the Amakosa in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. His son, who was my great-grandfather, ran one of the first printing presses in the Eastern Cape, printing the stories of battles on the farms between the English colonists and the Amakosa. His son, in turn, was my grandfather, who was born during the Anglo-Boer War, the fight between the British and the Afrikaners over control of Southern Africa. And he enlisted in, as a 15-year-old in the First World War and fought in the trenches in Europe. My father grew up in the shadow of a militarized man and his teenage years were in the Second World War. And I grew up in the shadow of the South African border war in which the apartheid military fought Africans and Cubans engaged in liberation struggles across South Africa, Namibia, Angola, and Mozambique. Five generations, five wars, some local, all global, all bound up in the rise of modernity and coloniality. And in opening a debate about South Africa's discussions about land, economy, and ecology at this time in our Anthropocene. I speak then as one of the privileged who had the benefit of a lineage of patriarchs who won wars, who had access to land under the sign of empire, and who had privileged positions in the economy under the sign of apartheid. My father had a whites-only job, and as a, as a child, I attended a whites-only school, where a teacher who read us William Shakespeare's King Lear taught me that the wheel of fortune was not the natural order of things, but an effect of ideas and power and actions. And strangely enough, from the story of King Lear, I found the courage to persuade my father to send me to the University of Cape Town, which he called Little Moscow on the Hill, where I began to find my voice in student protests and find my feet in running from tear gas. Turn the wheels of power did in South Africa, led by trade unionists, by women activists, by prisoners and detainees in jails and in exile. And the cry of the time was Amandla Ngawetu, power to the people, the cry that made another world possible in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as president in 1994. By 2004, 10 years into democracy, the wheel in the trade union logo of the struggle in the 1980s had turned, indeed, for many activists, Many former trade union leaders were now absorbed into a new class of elites, occupying prestigious positions in business. And the supply of water and electricity to townships was one of the great achievements of that time of Nelson Mandela's government. And in the course of that decade, the liberation cry, power to the people, gave force to a national project of supplying electricity to the people. In 2014, 20 years into our democracy, the struggle has continued for the impoverished and the marginalized while the Wheel of Fortune has continued to turn for others. Between 1993 and 2009, South Africa's Gini coefficient, the indicator 
formed by economists about inequality increased rather than decreased, making South Africa, along with Brazil, one of the most unequal societies in the world. At the same time, our single national electricity supplier is in financial trouble and unable to supply all the energy needs for the developing economy. Into this deepening crisis around the shortage of electricity that would support the economic development, that would bring the jobs, that would lower the Gini coefficient, stepped the oil industry in the form of a study commissioned by Shell South Africa, which described shale gas in the semi-arid Karoo region in the central South African area as a game changer for the economy. That report estimated the amount of gas to be in the hundreds of trillions of cubic feet. The wheel no longer needed revolution. There was a new game in town. And thus it was that South African President Jacob Zuma's State of the Nation address in May this year announced that shale gas extraction, or fracking, would go ahead. Now, fracking is a new technology. It involves drilling vertically several kilometers under the surface of the earth and then trilling, turning the drill head sideways to drill horizontally along a stratum of shale. And once drilled, some 20 million liters of water per frack, per well, and a well can be fracked many times, are pumped in at high pressure, up to five tons of pressure applied, along with, per frack, per well, 200,000 liters of chemicals, which the petroleum industry keeps telling us is only 1%, in order to fracture the seam and collect the gas in the liquid. Once removed, these several millions of liters of fracking fluid will need to be kept permanently out of the hydrological cycle. And since each well can be fracked several times and hundreds of wells can be created per shale formation, the loss of water to the region will be in the trillions of liters. The argument that shale gas fracking will be a game changer for the South African economy is that it will provide us with energy autonomy, that it will create jobs, thus creating the conditions of power in which finally an historic economic adjustment can take place, one that will unlock the wealth of the land. And such a game changer would address the historic injustices of global wealth and power and the legacy of wars that have accompanied the making of modernity in South Africa, which has scorched ecologies and displaced so many from its economies. The paradox, however, is that the game changer will also scorch ecologies. And it is the same game that has brought the planet to the beginnings of catastrophe. It is the logic of the Anthropocene in which the growth of capital is at the expense of soil and water. Speaking against the game changer argument is a challenge for those of us who grapple with what it means to be human in this Anthropocene in a place like South Africa, which grapples with the historical legacies of inequality. Familiar in the opposition of environment and development is that binary of modernist thought, nature versus society. And notwithstanding the work of many South African scientists and engineers to link environmentalism with justice and sustainability, the binary has been an obstinate one. Environmentalism in South Africa readily slips into the genre of the white man's burden, a new charity in opposition to the apparently real world framed by the urgency of the agenda of reparative economics that takes form in response to immense suffering. Where green is the new red in many parts of the world, green risks slipping inexorably in South Africa into the new white. And the argument is not simply pejorative in a context in which environmentalism has historically proceeded and often continues to proceed by military means. The case risks being closed, the game altered by the promises of new fuel technologies as South Africa powers its way into that brave new world where the South can finally compete with the North on its own terms. And the argument of the game changes in government is that in order to address the cries of the Southern African precariat to enter the global economy, sacrifices of ecology are needed. The South African land will pay the price of redemption from the entrenched global economic order based on fossil fuels. Looking at this anthropologically, ontologically, there's something very interesting going on here. Because where the conceptual force of racism involved transforming human subjects into objects whose labor could be extracted by force to power the colonial and apartheid economies, the fracking lobby transforms the land into an object whose gas can be extracted by force to power the nation's liberation from the shackles of a racist economy via the particular distribution of profits proposed by government. The substitutionary atonement that the land must offer in the fracking game is indeed messianic. For former South African energy minister, Dipua Peters, the gas in the shale formations beneath the Karoo region is, quote, the blessing of God. The implication for patriots 
is that one dare not act against God, notwithstanding the banning by the city of angels, Los Angeles, of fracking in its ter territory, as has Nova Scotia, as has France and Germany, and many other towns, cities and states worldwide. And the irony of the substitutionary atonement argument in South Africa is its usefulness for the fossil fuel industry, where the colonial order was characterized by spectacular displays of wanton destruction of human life, in the words of Achille Mbembe and necropolitics, a politics of the living dead, the neo-colonial order of multinational order companies is characterized by spectacular displays of mass destruction of remote places. One Chevron lobbyist in the course of its 18 year, $9 billion court battle against Ecuador to clean up the Amazon which had polluted, memorably wrote, we can't let little countries screw around with big companies like this. A senior figure in the World Bank who proposed exporting e-waste to Africa as a new industry, wrote, to justify this, Africa is under-polluted. Such a necro-political ecology is not limited to the former colonies in Africa and Latin America. Neoliberal economics constitutes a new colonialism, um, one that works by the reduction of everything to one value, market value. Echoing Beth Parvanelli's argument on this regard, Michael Finewood and Laura Stroop quote or note in their critique of fracking logics in the USA that, and I quote, as market approaches to environmental regulation become more accepted and perhaps a dominant part of government strategy, places like northeastern Pennsylvania are written off for environmental destruction in the name of a higher purpose, such as the national interest. These sacrifice zones assume an ecological disconnect between people and their environment, normalizing environmental degradation in some places while protecting others and also assume no alternative uses of land or energy resources. This can be viewed as a form of remote environmental exploitation and brutality, where the scalar issues make these sacrifice zones almost invisible to the larger nation and the world. Struggles over shell gas are indeed contests over the divinities of reason in our political cosmos. They are struggles over development, citizenship, nature, empowerment, struggles over governance itself, struggles over the production of evidentiaries, struggles over histories and futures and what it means to be a person in the Anthropocene in the age of rage, the rage of those excluded from the peace of consumerism at the end of the modernist dream. The peace treaty of the moment in South Africa is the Pax Consumerati, in which the rage for economic reparations is to be exploded into the earth, secret, hidden, remote, seismic explosions to release historical debts and finally, establish the possibility for all to be equally human. Race, rage, and grief, becoming human in the Anthropocene is the music of our spheres. Amid all of the history of human injustice in the past few centuries, the struggle for equality comes to fruit at precisely the same moment as the struggle to keep the Earth's ecological systems alive. We who were, who were raised on the idea of credit against future earnings are learning that our future visas on the planet are already overdrawn. Liberation in South Africa has been tied up with a dream of consumption, and indeed, many of our political leaders flaunt Mercedes-Benz's, Breitling's, Dolce & Gabbana as if there were no tomorrow. And indeed, why should there be? For South Africa is one of the non-annex countries in terms of the Kyoto Protocol, the logic of which is broadly, if elite excesses have produced this Anthropocene, why should those who were left out limit their prospects? And in terms of this idea, non-annex countries have a longer time frame to reduce emissions, and as such, South Africa is busy building a new coal-fired power station. The creation of categories of annex countries and non-annex countries reflects on the one hand a concern for justice, but on the other hand a distrust of the climate change agenda as the new universalism, which risks distracting us from the task of addressing historic inequalities. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change noted that South Africa was one of the few parties who are highly dependent on income generated from fossil fuels, and who are concerned about possible impacts on their economies of the implementation of mitigation measures by developed country parties. So what then is the role of the environmental humanities, environmental anthropology, in non-annex countries like South Africa, which claim exemption from binding obligations to reduce emissions immediately? As I see it, as I see it our challenge is nothing less than the restoring of what it means to be human, what it means to be a person in a time of endings, what it means to become human in the Anthropocene. The need is for a game changer indeed, but a reparative economics in nuclear and in fracking is not a game changer at all, but a ne necropolitics by other means. 
With South Africa poised on the edge of selling its Karoo substrata to oil companies in order, in order to change its economy, I want to make a case for a reparative ecologics in three separate vignettes in this paper to try to disrupt the point and counterpoint in the familiar rhythms of arguments for and against fracking in which ecology and economy are pitted as opposites, society versus nature. In the first part, I want to trace, if you like, a geoethnography of gas in the Karoo, looking at, at methane in relation to the rock and the water and the, and the ecology. In the second vignette, I want to think about cement, or cosmology of cement, the substance that has literally enabled moderns to make rock at will and create an earth according to a particular cosmological geometry proposed by Descartes when he laid the foundations of modernist thought. And the third vignette proposes an alternative cosmology, cosmology and ecologics for the Anthropocene. So, to try to think about how to do an ethnography of gas, uh, I've called the section rock, water, methane, sun, Karoo. Now, the word Karoo, which is the name for this region, is a sand word, which means land of great thirst. It's a semi-arid, sparsely populated region of about 600,000 square kilometers, farmed with sheep, olives, and game hunting. It comprises dusty roads, sand rock shelters, small bushes, which have taken hundreds of years to get to a bonsai size, and new shanty towns that have sprung up as farm workers have been displaced by the new agricultural economics. The Karoo Basin itself was formed in the Jurassic era, at a time when the first great dinosaurs would be appearing in Tanzania, in Central Africa, along with the first small mammals, and the dinosaurs were just beginning to fly. Africa, at that time, was still connected to South America, Asia, and Antarctica. And the end of what was at that time the global Karoo Ice Age, named after the particular glacial tills in the Karoo region, was curiously hastened by the evolution of a new actor network on the planet, the termites, whose stomachs returned carbon to the air as the greenhouse gas, gas methane, bringing about a period of global warming that ended that ice age. For shale gas drillers chasing after methane now, the major area of interest is the group of shales in the southern Karoo where methane is concentrated, and of which South African holdings are expected to be the fifth largest in the world. However, those shell formations themselves are punctuated by later intrusions of volcanic magma, which together with periods of uplift and depression have rendered that stratigraphy so convoluted that there are about 14 hot springs that spew steaming water from the depths of the earth. The implication is that water here flows upwards. And conversely, rainwater recharge of the aquifers on which the area depends shows us that the water flows down too. Um, how that rainwater recharge occurs is, is known, but is not understood. And this very complex hydrogeological cycle is a cause for central concern, because if it is a crack in one of the thousands of cement casings of fracking wells that will extend between two and five kilometers under the surface, the pollutants may well flow upwards or downwards to contaminate groundwater. And if there's a spill in one part of the crew, aquifers, aquifers very far away risk also being p p polluted into perpetuity. Give us evidence is the argument of the fracking lobby, and a Duke University study highlighted four areas of concern in regards to water management in the US-based fracking industry, based on analysis of published data. And these are stray gas contamination, surface water impacts, and the accumulation of deep radiation in some disposal and spill sites. The study notes, however, that the direct contamination of shallow groundwater from hydraulic fracturing fluids remains controversial. The evidence, in other words, was unclear to the scientific community. But through the work of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and the media and the social science journals, it has become increasingly clear that the evidentiaries apparent in the science journals upon which studies like that are based were being systematically compromised by the oil companies. The cover for fracking denialism was blown as, as much as a few weeks ago uh, in August this year by the Pennsylvania Department for Environmental Protection, which noted in a space of six or seven years some 243 instances of contamination of private water supplies by fracking activities, which included the contamination of multiple water points. In other words, every one of those 243 accidents affected multiple families and, and farms. So that's roughly 35 accidents per year, or about three per month, in only one state. The advertising campaign of Shell South Africa proposes to tap into natural gas and nuclear 
so that we can keep the lights on when she is your age, using an image that is an archetype of the consumer scene, an image of a young, bespectacled daughter of the suburban terror, about eight or nine years old, reading with a nightlight in a warm, cozy bed. Let's keep the lights on when she's your age. Yet fracking proposes to release geologically stored methane, which in the long term is 40 times more potent than carbon dioxide in trapping infrared radiation. At the very same moment in which alarm bells are ringing in the Arctic and Siberia about the release of permafrost stored methane from entering the atmosphere. Um, and this in a place like the Karoo, which is one of the best solar energy sites in the world. Shell's archetypical daughter of South Africa might have light, but will she survive the heat? In the life sciences, new fields have emerged with the suffix omics, like genomics or metabolomics. And the work in these fields is to think integratively across scales and relationalities. Thinking of the Karoo as rock, water, methane, sun, and daughters, and in time scales from the Carboniferous and the Jurassic into colonial history, political ecology of the moment, and into the permanent future, is to begin to develop an omics for an ecos of people, earth, and creatures, an economics in a word. And this kind of work, I want to suggest, is a, a remodeled ethnography for the Anthropocene. Secondly, I want to think a little bit about cement. In following the engineering debates about the disposal of waste water and the design of better well casings to prevent methane from straying out of the drilled shafts, which is part of the logic of we can engineer it better, these drilled shafts will have a depth that is equivalent to five and a half table mountains. If you can think of table mountain in, in Cape Town, that table mountain is a thousand meters above sea level. Well, imagine creating a cement pipe underground where you cannot see it between three and five times the height of table mountain without making a mistake once and doing that several thousand times over. And it's difficult as you think about the scale of the problem not to note as an anthropological curiosity what I want to call the cosmology of cement the unshakable belief that the cement that will be used to line and plug the thousands upon thousands of fracking wells and waste water sites can be trusted into perpetuity to withstand the flows of gas, the flows of liquids, and the movement of tectonic plates and magma and create extraterrestrial zones that are out of the flows of the planet itself forever. Perhaps the artifact of modernity, cement exemplifies a belief in an extraordinary human power to hold terrestrial forces at bay that it will hold toxic water permanently out of hydrogeological geolo processes, and that it will be immune to all states of matter and matters of state in revolutionary uprisings or wars in which toxic facilities would be targets. In every sense, cement is a magical substance in a cosmology pervasive in modernity that engineering can and will come up with a way to keep fracking water or nuclear waste out of hydrological cycles and tectonic processes, and that states simply need to regulate it. The belief in the power of cement confers upon humans the power to enact upon the earth the transformation of liquid to solid, the division of economy from ecology, the separation of human activity from ecological and planetary systems. Outside of space and outside of time, cement is believed immune to tectonic movement and impervious to osmosis in perpetuity. Cement, as such, enacts human exceptionalism, the self-image of moderns as denatured, dematerialized, separate from the planet itself. We confront, in the use of cement in fracking, the cosmology at the heart of modernity. René Descartes' discourse on methods, optics, meteorology, and geometry, in which the thought of those ancient indigenous scholars, Euclid and Pythagoras, was remade as the foundation of a way of producing a metrics of space, geometry which separated Earth from the human person, the cogito whose being is related to thought and ideas independent of space or time or context. The Earth made in the image of modernist thought is a world made of Platonic and Archimedean solids, not the thought of the ancient Chinese for whom the geometry of the world ought to have been understood in flows and propensities nor that of Amerindian thought in which the world is not abstract space that can be measured in metrics, but made constantly by the movements of interacting bodies. Both, both Husserl and Derrida wrote their first books on geometry, finding in the abstract production of the metrics of space the beginning of the problem with the philosophy of self. And together with Michel Serre, they call for a different way of doing geometrics, measuring Earth and space in ways that open ourselves to living in the planet, an ethical way of calculating, measuring, and engineering our presence in space and in time. 
Which leads me to the last part, which is the question of becoming human in the Anthropocene. What might it mean to be a person now at the end of a philosophy that for so long, hundreds of years, has extracted human relations from the earth? I've had the privilege in the past five years of working with an extraordinary group of graduate researchers who have sought to grasp everyday ecological philosophies in different parts of Southern Africa. The major finding of the project is the ways in which regional ecological thought is tied in to what it is to be human. Chris Mabeza, for example, describes the work of a farmer named Zephaniah Piri Maseko, who has managed to create an oasis with a small spring in a dry area of Zimbabwe, with a philosophy that he calls the marriage of soil and water, in which the soil itself is part of the extended household, bound into the fecundity of that household with its births, its deaths, and its food. Josh Cohen describes the way in which plant medicine in the Maquiland and his PhD uses, in which the, 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 the plant medicine doctors focus on the use of plants for strengthening energy, vitality, and well-being, rather than a form of plant medicine that enables combative relationships with viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Otwal Nemachana describes the idea of Chivanyu in Zimbabwe, which translates as the ways of human beings, as a resource that people drew on for surviving intense state violence, the objective of, of which was to destroy protesting subjects, protesting political subjects, and he explores the ways in which aspects of Chivanyu, the ways of human beings, in, such as kukumbiri, to request a petition, mweya, wind, air, or breath, ukama, relationships of interdependence with the environment, kutenda, to thank, and kunzwa, to sense, played out in the modes of survival among the villagers. Their work, and that of others, begins to offer fresh ways of reimagining the connections from which we've been separated. Um, the, uh, where am I? The, the words ecology, economy, and ecumen, which we use to describe what we're trying to grapple with, all, interesting enough, derive from the Greek word ekos, which means household. And what is significant in the work of these graduates is the finding that land is absolutely not reducible to questions about productivity, efficiency, yields, inputs and outputs, and farm labor. Rather, water, soil, and air are part of humanity, part of personhood itself, part of relations of care, nurture, and reciprocity, and the interweaving of personhood, air, water, and soil. The Southern African term Ubuntu finds its expression in many Southern African languages, and it means broadly that a person is a person through other people, a philosophy that's being drawn upon by our constitutional court judges as they try to reimagine what law ought to do in South Africa. And as a philosophy of personhood, it's widespread across Southern Africa, and it suggests, the, the work that of these graduates suggests that the very idea of being a person is a little bit different to what we be, think when we translate that word, that phrase, a person is a person through other people. We're using the English word person, but here the person begins with soil, earth, and land, an aspect that is lost historically in, with the loss of land rights of black South Africans in the, throughout the 20th century. What is striking is that these ecosophical resources are coming from non-annexed countries, those that are not bound by Kyoto to reduce the emissions now. And the stark irony with which we must grapple now is that the non-annexed countries, like South Africa, have declined to take a lead in offering different intellectual heritages, which they claim to promote through indigenous knowledge policies, um, and through which we could begin to think what it means to be human in an earth that flames, frames climate catastrophe. I'm really hopeful that in our dialogues this week here in Rio de Janeiro, we might begin to strengthen the possibilities for the fragile intellectual heritages of the non-annexed countries in particular to make their contribution in the development of a kind of politics that takes life itself as a central concern. But to return to the Karoo, how might some of these ideas work there? Poisoning is easy, but nurturing is a craft, Isabel Stengers reminds us. Land redistribution is a central task of the post-apartheid government and one that has been very slow to take form. 20 years into democracy, we've redistributed only a fraction of the land. But land redistribution in such a huge area of South Africa with poisoned wells would heap cruelty upon cruelty. One cannot improve an economy and equalize an ecumen in a toxic ecology. 
A game-changing politics here would be decision-making with people, with soil, with water, with winds, with colonial history, the sun, the Arctic, and Siberia in mind, an ethnography of gas, of methane. Is such a politics of life possible? Dominic Boyer's observation that the fossil economy is fossilized is apt in South Africa, which is reliant on a single centralized energy provider that is dependent on coal and nuclear and characterized by inefficient long supply chains. A post-fossil future demands a new political ecology of energy, short supply chains, many power production centers, and the pluralization of energy futures with interlinked energy producers. In short, the democratization of energy debates. That kind of game-changing renewable energy economy is already partly sketched out by a number of energy researchers in South Africa, where Mining the Sky is the logo of one of the solar companies working to set up large solar energy plants in South Africa, working with today's sun energy today, instead of mining the solar energy that is stored in the earth from the algae that was stored in the water in the years before the dinosaurs. Current solar farms in South Africa already produce the equivalent of half of what one nuclear reactor produces near Cape Town at a fraction of the cost. That project could be immeasurably strengthened by a change of policy that would remove the current caps on the amount of renewable energy that may be produced, caps that are generated in part by a fear that they will, they will threaten the economy of current energy provision. And by investing in, instead in an, in an energy infrastructure that could take feeds into the national grid from many places, but perhaps most of all, by drawing on an African intellectual heritage about the relations of water, sun, soil, breath, and humanness as the basis of land redistribu redistribution in a reparative ecology in the energy-hungry Anthropocene. Thank you.